will be a quick video on just uh, the differences between reenactment weapons and real weapons. Um, so, to start off, I am going to talk about the axe. Really, there's almost no difference between this and a real axe. Um, it performs the same way. It is actually an axe head that can be sharpened. Um, the only real difference is, is that the leading and trailing edges are blunted. Uh, they're rounded off so that when you accidentally hook somebody or something, this doesn't dig in at all, minimizes damage. Uh, same thing with the edge. The edge is rolled, uh, is uh, rounded over or rebated. Uh, the society I'm with says that axes have to be three mil thick on the edge. Uh, that's because they do t pack quite a bit of a punch and if it's any thinner than that, it uh, maximizes the, the force on it. Which is the way an axe works. It just focuses all of the weight of the head into the, the edge. So uh, the bigger the edge, the safer it is. Um, so with this, there's really no difference. It's just a blunted axe. That's all it is. Um, it performs the same everything. Uh, the next is saxes. Uh, this one is not the greatest example of a reenactment sax. Uh, it is way out of its, it, for, to, to, to me anyway, it's way too wide. Um, it's too thick on the spine. It doesn't quite taper the way that a sax probably would. Um, it has this weird thing going on here. Uh, the handle's weird. The, there's two fullers, which I don't know of any sax that has a fuller. Um, so this one's just a really bad example. It works, um, and it is popular uh, with green actors. Um, but to each their own. Um, so the only real difference in, in the other saxes is that their form and function pretty much the same. Um, they have a round end that uh, is about as big around as my thumb, um, and the edges are rounded over. So again, it's just blunt uh, and not pointy. It's the only real difference in the saxes. Um, oh yeah, this one has a, a through tang, which also isn't very nice, but whatever. Uh, spears, spears differ a little bit. Um, they most of the reenactment ones I've seen have this uh, split uh, socket, which is supposed to be so that when it jams on, you can actually get it almost friction fit because it's forcing against this, and then obviously the rivet that goes through. Um, the other difference, um, well. With the sockets, the original ones that I've seen, most of them are either uh, just lapped over or welded. They don't actually have this big gap, um, so forge welded over. Um, so there's that. The other one is if you look here, the the plane of where this is 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 different than what uh, an actual spear would be. Uh, spears usually want to be in the same plane, the point being in the same plane as the socket not staggered by a quarter of an inch. Um, the reason that this one is, is because it's not forged, it's uh, machine made. So basically what they do is cut this water jet, cut out a blank, uh, use a machine to bend the socket, and then, or a press even, to bend the socket, and then uh, weld this, this uh, rod, piece of rod on the end. Um, and so it's obviously not going to be in line the way that a normal spear is. And the other difference, again, is that it's blunt. It has this kind of a nub on the end, or the point is actually forged to a round thing, or the end, the end is actually curled over the way that um, swords for thrusting in HEMA generally should be. Um, so, again, it's just blunt. That's the re really the only difference. Uh, it's hafted the same way that that a, a real spear would be. Uh, so those weapons don't really differ very much. But what I found is that reenactment swords differ quite a bit. Um, this is an armor class. It's sort of just a general representation. Um, I'm not saying that this is the only sword that does this. I'm not saying this is the only manufacturer that does this. This is just the sword I have on hand. Um, and I I can say a lot of good things about this, this maker. Um, this sort of sort of evidence of that for reenactment, not for not necessarily for cut tests. I have no knowledge of how armor, armor class swords perform as sharps, um, and it's certainly not from a human perspective um, because I know these aren't designed for that 
these ones, uh, they are designed for reenactment. Um, so just to start off, the hilt assembly. Um, the fittings are your normal sized fittings, but then the grip is extra long. Um, and, you know, period examples of a sword similar to this, single-handed sword of around the Viking age. Uh, this one is early Norman period, so it's sort of tail end of the Viking age. Um, would really only be about as big as the, the bottom of my hand, not very much more. Um, so, you know, that's quite a lot longer. It's about, I guess, four centimeters longer than it needs to be. Um, but I understand why they do that. Uh, the reason that the grip is so long is because these swords are designed for somebody using a big padded gauntlet. Um, and it might not, and it's not even the type of gauntlet that they use for HEMA, um, because in reenactment you want to have some semblance of authenticity on it, but you also want to have the amount of protection. So somebody might be wearing quite a large glove where, with, with this, uh, whereas if they were doing HEMA, the glove is designed to fit more towards the original swords. Um, and so that explains the big, the big guard, or the big guy grip. Um, and so I, I get it. Um, my, the gauntlets I have, uh, they fit really comfortably on this. There's extra space. Um, they do fit comfortably in a, in a hilt that's just a little bit larger than uh, period for Viking, uh, or sort of average for the Viking Age. Um, so, does it need to be this quite this big? Maybe not. Uh, but these are certainly not the only manufacturer that, that makes them in this size. Armor class certainly is not. Um, I know some Dark Sword ones are, are a little on the large side. Um, most of Hanways are a little on the large side. Um, I think the closest they come to, to getting it almost right is the uh, uh, Tinker Pierce Viking Sword, but that one still is a little bit large. Uh, again, because it's designed for using with padded gloves. Um, and so that's, that is kind of why they're like this. Uh, now for the blades, the reason that the blade isn't exactly the, the period shape, um, because you know, a, a Viking sword would be a little bit wider at the hilt and a little wider than this at the tip, uh, and then, then coming to a somewhat even point. Um, the reason that they're like this is because of minimum safety requirements for different societies. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Armor Class uh, designed them to work with societies like uh, Vikings UK, which has a minimum safety requirement being a sword blade must be two mil thick at the edge. Um, so you end up with it having to be two millimeters here, maybe 2.5 to 3 in the center, uh, well, on the either, either side of the fuller. Um, and so they are quite thick, but they also wanted them to perform safely. Uh, so you have to make a sword that's, you know, less, less than two and a half, three pounds. Uh, it's certainly less than, than three pounds, um, but, you know, clo close to two, so that it's not a very heavy sword at all, uh, but it's still thick enough. So they had to sacrifice the authenticity of the width in order to make a blade that performs safely and and meets standards. Um, even even the Hanway Tinker Pierce, which I think does look a little bit more authentic, um, is still not much wider at the hilt than this this sword, um, and the blade profile closer to the tip is almost identical. So even there, where their blade is actually thinner than this and more flexible, uh, they went with the, a similar thing, so that it ends up being very light and very responsive. Um, so that's sort of why the blades are, aren't exactly like this. They sacrifice uh, safety requirements. They sacrifice authenticity for the safety requirements and performance of the sword. So it's sort of a... It's sort of an interesting um, compromise. Uh, one thing they do 
on these ones in particular is they actually put a little bit of a swell at the tip which as far as heavy thrusts go uh, this won't do too much to save you but the light thrusting that does, that's done in reenactment this can actually somewhat help prevent an injury it won't entirely prevent it uh, because people do uh, do sometimes end up with uh, uh, pierced biceps and stuff and, and this type of sword has been known to, to pierce uh, gamesons not, again, not necessarily armor class, but fairly stiff bladed reenactment swords uh, because they don't really give in the thrust. Um, and the reason that the blades are so stiff, uh, it's, it's, I think it's partially because if you have a sword that, uh, like the, uh, I played with a, a long sword this weekend that was uh, designed for HEMA. Um, and it, it has the whole thing where it flexes in the last third of the blade and all, and all that stuff. Um, I noticed that compared to something like this or um, a stiffer bladed longsword that I played with before, uh, the blade was a little bit whippy. And so if, if, if somebody parries with a shield in the wrong thing, that blade could actually bounce and flick them in the face or something. Where in HEMA, that's not exactly a problem because you should be wearing some form of face protection. Uh, either, uh, if you're an armored fighter, obviously a full face mask on your helmet. Um, or if you're an unarmored fight fighter and you're fighting with uh, just a padded jack on, um, then you should be wearing a mask. And you should be wearing one of the, the HEMA or the fencing masks. Um, and so, in reenactment, because you, know, you go up against guys that have... Uh, an open face spangin' helm, or um, a leather helmet, or a Yerman Boo helm, which only protects just down to the nose and up. Um, a a spangin' helm with the, just the nasal. Um, you know, you, you you have to minimize getting hit in the, uh, the the risk of getting hit in the face or something. And if you have a stiffer bladed sword, it's less likely to bounce. Um, so that's one part of it. The other thing that I think is that a lot of these makers, because they know that uh, these things, these swords are going to take a lot, a lot of abuse. Um, and you know, with with Hema, uh, you know, you, you you spar at your club or or you know wherever wherever you spar, um, and then you know you, you go home, you pack up your gear and all this stuff. Uh, reenactment, you could be at an event in the rain all weekend and not be able to actually maintain your gear till you get home. And that could be a while. And so they design it so that it can take a lot of abuse. And a lot of companies do use somewhat corrosion resistant steels. Um, Armor Class went for the toughest steel they could so that when it takes an impact, it uh, resists chipping and resists burrs, it just dents. Uh, but even then it's not really denting that much. Uh, some go with corrosion resistance so that if so that it keeps maintenance down a little bit. Um, but they they really just temper them so that they are resistant to damage. Um, that's partially so that this sword will last a lot longer than something that gets chewed up and has to be uh, reground and everything all the time or filed down. Um, but it's also if in the middle of a battle this thing starts to get heavy, heavily burred, and then somebody comes along and they slash across somebody's chest. Um, so in HEMA, you're wearing your uh, your padded jack and everything, and you sort of expect your gambits and all that stuff to get to get torn up a little bit. You kind of expect it. Uh, you don't necessarily like it when it happens because those things are expensive, but it's something that better that than your body. Uh, in reenactment. People are sometimes fighting in just linen. Uh, some people fight in uh, a few layers of linen. Some people leave it, some people fight in chainmail. So you don't know what your your opponent is going to be wearing. And so if you slide this across and it's covering burrs down a person's uh, a person's chest, you know you if they're not wearing a shirt or if you hit them in the arm and they're they're not wearing uh, anything covering their arms. You could slice them wide open with these burrs. Um, if you're going, you could be going up against somebody who takes pride in the fact that they're wearing a 
hand-sewn, hand-woven, uh, natural dyed kirtle. And that, that is pretty expensive, uh, regardless of whether it's purchased, uh, then it's certainly very expensive. If it's um, something that they made from scratch, it's very, very time expensive. And sometimes the materials are very expensive as well. So, you know, you want to minimize damage to people's equipment. Um, so what they do with these is they temper them so that they don't produce burrs as much. And when they do, it's not going to be like a big razor. Um, so I think that's why, but when they do that, they sacrifice the flexibility of the blades, uh, creating a very, usually a very, a very stiff blade, um, which is not good for thrusts. That's why most societies pull the thrust so that it doesn't actually poke into somebody. Um, and so for reenactment, these swords work with the rules that they're intended to be used with. Uh, I wouldn't use it for something with heavy thrusts. It's just that they're designed for that. Um, because if you temper something to be springy enough to bend uh, when thrust into somebody or thrust at somebody, it's uh, it's going to be a lot softer, so which means that it'll dent, it'll create burrs a lot easier, uh, a lot more easily than than this does. So that's kind of the differences. Um, most of the weapons don't really don't really aren't really different than uh, your average one. Um, like an axe like this, uh, if people were wearing the right kind of protection, could be used for hema style sparring. Um, you, obviously, you would need something a little heavier than just um, just your gambeson or padded jack. Um, saxes uh, and daggers that are that are like these, they're just blunt. As long as the tip is rounded, uh, and if you're thrusting with it heavily, um, I would even say that the tip ha has that rolled edge on it, uh, or the rolled tips, um, just because that can penetrate stuff. Um, you know, they don't differ very much uh, between reenactment and HEMA and real weapons. Um, spears, they don't really differ too much. Swords are, are very different depending on the intended purpose. Um, and whether it's a replica, a, a, a true replica, a reenactment representation, uh, a functional hemosword, or a, uh, um, a, an actual artifact, uh, they do differ a lot. Um, I do have my opinions on, uh, Viking, or I do have my opinions on Viking swords for reenactment, um, but before... The ideas that I have, which is people using uh, true, true representations, at least in the hilt. Uh, I understand the blades um, to to a degree. I understand the blades. I do think they need to have more flex, but that's a different thing. Um, but in the hilts, I believe that they do need to to make them um, more true. Not necessarily as small, but close, closer than than some are, um, you know, because this gets to the point where you can almost use it two-handed, <laughs> and that's, that's the way that a number of them are, uh, so it's, it's pretty close, and I have fairly large hands, um, but what they need to do is, before that the sword manufacturers can change the, um, the grip lengths, there needs to be a change in the type of gauntlet and type of glove used by reenactors um, so that they can actually have something that is safe enough for them to use but also looks suitably authentic which uh, Viking gauntlets there really aren't any um, but something that looks suitably period um, and also uh, gives you the ability to hold a sword you know the way that you're, you're supposed to um, so, that's just that. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a huge, huge problem with this. Um, as long as people aren't saying, yes, this is a true Viking sword. This is exactly the way it was. Uh, these are our fighting swords. Um, they're, they're the reenactment sword that we use. So, uh, you know, if, we ha if, if you need it, an absolute, if you absolutely need a, a sword that's a true representation for a display purpose, obviously get that one.
uh, get something that is true to form. Um, if you need something that is safe to use for combat and good enough um, for for reactive purposes and everything, then these are are they're great. Um, they they fit their their purpose. Uh, you just need to make sure for safety that you follow the rules that your group has and that the sword that you buy or the weapon that you buy uh, can actually follow those rules. Uh, these are not so good for thrusting safely. They don't bend. Um, so if you thrust, make sure that you have one that bends. And probably it's a good idea to have the rolled tip on the end so that it actually distributes the, the load on the uh, target properly. Because um, these this kind of tip, even if it bends, can penetrate. So, just a bunch of things to keep in mind, um, and it's sort of just a how things differ from from what they what they uh, represent. So, I hope uh, people found this interesting. Uh, if you like what you see, please don't hesitate to like and subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, I try to I try to answer any questions in the comments or anything. So, uh, thank you very much.